Hello, hello, grade 12. Welcome back to the channel, Science Therapy, hosted by the one and only science therapist, O Abudewa Sos, O Gobela Wemet. And without any further ado, let's look at these questions that we have here. Okay, so we have Gauteng Department of Education Preparatory Examination 2020. And then in today's uh, lesson, we are looking at mathematics uh, paper two, which is in preparation for the exam that you are going to write on Tuesday, your prelim paper two. Then as you can see, your time is three hours and then max 150. We have 14 pages and inclusive of the one information sheet, meaning this one is on page 15, the last uh, page of the uh, question paper, right? We have our instructions and information. It says read the following instructions carefully before answering the questions. Number one, this question paper consists of 10 questions and then answer all the questions in the answer book provided. Clearly show all calculations, diagrams, graphs, etc. that you have used to determine the answers. Answers only will not necessarily be awarded full marks. And then you may use an approved scientific calculator, which is a non-programmable and non-graphical, unless stated otherwise. And then if necessary, round off answers to two decimal places. Note that unless stated otherwise, then diagrams are not necessarily drawn to scale. An information sheet with formulae is included at the end of the question paper. Write neatly and legibly okay right so now we have our question one and then we know that uh, we are starting with one variable stats it says the a arithmetic high school arithmetic high school decided to compare the results of 31 grade 12 learners in mathematics and physical sciences in the 2019 preparatory examination. The mathematics results are recorded in the table below. The box and whisker plot below illustrates the results of physical sciences and then marks are recorded as percentages. So as we can see, the mathematics results are recorded on a table while the physical sciences results are recorded on a box and whisker diagram. Then 1.1 says calculate the mean mark of the mathematics learners. Now that is very simple. For two marks, all we have to do is we add all these numbers in here and then divide by the sample space, which is 31. Remember that 31 learners in here, right? So if we add all these numbers here, we are going to end up with a total of 1,581. And then that will be divided by 31. And then our x bar now will be equals to 51. Okay, so two marks for that. So mark here and then a mark there. So this was for 1.1. And then now uh, they say comment on the skewness of the mathematics date. If you want to comment on the skewness, uh, it is best to look at the distance between Q1 to Q2 and then also Q2 to Q3. So you are trying to compare where do you have uh, much more data between Q1 to Q2 and Q2 to Q3. And where you have much data, that's the skewness of uh, the 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 data set or the box and whisker diagram right so as you can see here there is a much more greater distance between q2 and q3 so that means we can say this is skewed to the right so it is skewed to the right or you can say it is positively skewed positively skewed so either one of this would be correct for only a mark right then uh, let's proceed now we have 1.3. It says determine which subject performed better in the 2019 preparatory uh, examination. Give a reason for your answer. Right. So uh, for this here, I want to say if we have a look at this, uh, the one thing that will make us compare which ones performed best is to check the lower 25% of the results. So understand this with a 
a box and whisker from minimum to q1 this is representing 25 and then from q1 to q2 this is another 25 percent from q2 to q3 this will be representing another 25 percent of the data and then from a uh, q3 to the maximum this is 25 percent so if you add all these quartiles here they give you 100 percent right so we want to be looking at the 25th percentile and then let's check in physical sciences we can see that uh, within the first the lowest 25 percent we see that they achieved um 40 percent right our q1 is 40 percent and then let's look at the q1 of the mathematics paper so now that we know that we have 31 learners here can say our minimum is seven and then what will be our q1 remember q1 we first need to determine q2 the median of the data and then since this is 31 we know that we have to set 15 and 15 apart so one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen 14 15 so 52 here will have to be our q2 now from this the first uh, data here or the first half of the data that's where we're going to get our q1 which will be the median of the first half so this is one two three four five six seven and then this would be the median let's check one two two three four five six seven so we have set seven and seven apart making 28 our q1 so this is a q1 here is 28 and then our q2 obviously is 52 so you see i'm trying to indicate a a box and whisker diagram also for the mathematics result so here it would be one two three four five six seven and then uh, there we go one two three four five six seven so the 72 here would be our q3 and then the maximum would be 96. now which ones uh, performed better if we look at the q1 of the mathematics paper we can see that it is only 28 percent right so the 28 percent here tells you that most of the learners in mathematics they performed very very bad the lower 25 percent they performed very bad but then the lower 25 percent in physical sciences at least they were able to get 40 percent right so that means in other words there was a much better performance in physical sciences so there was a much more better performance in physical sciences why because q1 is q1 is equals to 40 percent uh, in physical sciences in physical sciences and then we have q1 being 28 percent in mathematics in mathematics so that means the lower 25 percent in physical sciences in physical sciences performed better performed better as compared to the ones in mathematics so physical sciences uh, is the one that performed a uh, is the subject in which there was a better performance right so your reasons are that your q1 in physical sciences is 40 percent while the q1 in mathematics is 28 percent so our q1 gives us accurate data in terms of the performance okay so now uh, let's check we have 1.4 it says write down a possible mark for a learner who achieved the 10th lowest mark in physical sciences now how do you go about this one so in physical sciences we can see that we are given in terms of the box and whisker now remember i said from minimum to q1 this represent 25 percent of the learners right there are 31 learners and then if we say multiply by 25 percent over 100 let's see how many learners uh, are in the lower 25 percent so there will be 20, 31 times 25 percent this is 7.75 which we can say approximately eight learners are being recorded in here right so we have approximately eight learners in here now if that 
eight learners within uh, the lower 25 percent that means the 10th uh, lowest learner would be found between q1 and q2 so if we have to predict uh, the possible mark that they got in physical sciences we do understand that it has to be somewhere between 40 to 50. now here there is no one accurate answer you can just write any answer between 40 to 50 and you would be correct because all the learners in between here uh, they belong to the all the learners between here that means they recorded more than uh, the eight learners that were recorded from the 31 are already here so the remaining learners they have to be in here because if we now calculate from the minimum to the maximum that's the 50th percentile so if we wanted to find how many learners from the minimum all the way to the 50 percent of the data we would say this is 31 multiplied by 50 over 100. And then we say uh, this would give us 15.5, so which is, we can say it's approximately 16 learners. So in between here to Q2, we have how many learners? We have 15 learners. We have 15 learners. So if you want to find the 10th uh, lowest mark, now you understand it has to be between Q2 and Q1 and Q2 because the eight learners here are between the minimum and Q1. So that means even if I were to come here and write 42%, I would still be correct. Even if I had to write uh, 49%, I would still be correct. Even 50%, 50% uh, now, nah, we okay. Okay, maybe, but then anything just between, anything between 40 to 50. So anything between 40 to 50, in between 40 and 50. And then uh, 1.5 says the learner scored the fourth highest in both subject. The learners obtain the greatest possible difference between both subjects. Calculate the, the learner's mark in physical sciences. Right, in physical sciences. Now, if we want to determine the learner's mark in physical sciences, this is what we are going to do. We can say, remember they said they had the greatest uh, difference so the fourth highest learner in mathematics it is clear to see because all the data has been recorded here so it's one two three four so the first the fourth highest in mathematics was 87 percent now we want to record their mark uh, in physical sciences but then there has to be the greatest difference in between those marks so if we go back here let's read a learner scored the fourth highest in both subjects now again let's go back to the fact that uh, this represents 25 percent and then this also represents another 25 percent right then we, of which we did say that uh, here about eight learners are in here and then here we said also it would be about eight learners and then also here we would find about uh, eight learners right because all represent a uh, 25 percent now if we have 31 minus 8 minus 8 minus 8 then we are left with about seven learners in here right we are left about with seven learners in here so that means the fourth highest learner would be found somewhere on the last 25 percent right then if we if there has to be the greatest variance between that we do understand that the learner might have achieved something like 71 percent just beyond the 70 here that's the only chance we have with the learner uh, obtaining the greatest variance or the greatest difference in th in their mathematics mark and their physical science mark right so just up just above this q3 value here this is what 71 percent and then if we say 87 percent minus 71 percent we get that the difference is what is 16 percent so in other words we can conclude that uh, the learner therefore the learner in physical sciences obtained 
71% because they belong here on the last 25%. Uh, percent. Okay, so that's how you were supposed to uh, go about answering that question. So all of these statistic questions were out of nine. And then, yep. So down with one variable statistics. Now we move to question two, which is normally your two variable statistics. Then a question, a question raised by many educators is whether the results that a learner achieves in an examination is dependent on the time that the learner takes to complete the examination. The average time taken by each of the top 10 mathematics learners was recorded. The data is represented in the table and scatter plot below, right? So we are given the average time uh, taken by each learner to complete the question paper and the marks that they obtain, right? So from the top 10. Now, 2.1 says calculate the equation of the least square regression line for the date. Now, obviously, we know with this type of uh, statistics, we need the aid of a calculator, whereby now we'll be coming to mode, and then we go to stats number three, and then we have our A plus BX, right? So you come to number two for the two variable data and then now as you can see you have x and y so that means the average time here will be representing x and the learner's marks will be representing y so the way they appear you just punch in all those values so we're going to start with the ones on x so that's 175 and then followed by so we have one seven five followed by one six five followed by one sixty then followed by one fifty three followed by one thirty nine followed by a uh, one thirty and then we have one twenty seven one thirty five and then one twenty and then we have 112. So yes, all 10 have been recorded. Then you go to go back up. And then you start recording the other ones. We have a 96 followed by 92 followed by 89, 87. 85 and then 83 76 72 then uh, 67 and 64 okay so you might want to confirm that uh, you have punched in everything correctly so 175 goes with 96 and then 165 goes with 92 all the way like that so you want to confirm confirm everything that is correct and then you press on shift one uh so it's shift you wait for it to change there and then one for your stat then what are we looking for uh, calculate the equation of the least square regression so remember if we want regression we go to reg number five and then we know with this one we first need to find the value of a and the value of b so that we can determine that line and then uh, a what is our value of a and i say our value of a is 12.41 and then now we are looking for the value of b so again on and then shift shift one regression again and then you go to two so our b is 0 0.48 so 0 0.49 rounded off to two decimal places and then our equation is in the form of y bx plus a and then y is equals to 0 0.49 x plus 12.41 and there you go you have your uh, equation of the least square regression line for the date 
Okay, so others, I'm aware that they might write it in that form, a plus bx. So it's still the same thing, guys. Even if you write it as 12.41 plus 0.49x, it's still one and the same thing. So here I'm just writing it in the form of y is equal to mx plus c because uh, we do understand that it is a straight line. Then, okay, let's proceed. Uh, it says Elena. A learner completed the exam in 2.5 hours. Predict the mark that the learner achieved. Right. So that means this is the part where we have to use our least square regression line. So we did our 0 0.49x plus 12.41. Uh, <laughs> so that means uh, we can substitute in here 0 0.49 and then where there is x we put 2.5 and then plus 12.41. So that's 0 0.49 times 2.5 plus 12.41. And then if I punch it into my calculator, I'm getting a... Uh, so, okay, let me check something. So our average time, oh, so we've been given in hours. So I get that. That was the tricky part of this question. So they gave us our average time in hours. And then this time, our average time was recorded in minutes. So the first thing that we have to do is convert this into minutes. So we have 2.5 multiplied by 60 first. Then 2.5 multiplied by 60 is going to give us 150 minutes. Hmm, smart then now we can use our regression line okay pardon me for that then plus 12.41 so this is why it's equals to 0 0.49 in bracket uh, 150 plus 12.41 so if you punch that into your calculator now you are going to get so all that into our calculator, we get 85.91, 85.91, which we can round off to say it is approximately 86%, right? It is approximately 86%. Then uh, explain within the context why the regression line is not reliable. Why is the regression line not reliable? So the reason why it is not reliable, mainly we comment this based on the uh, based on the y-intercept. Now, if I had to draw a line of best fit, remember my y-intercept again. Let me start by writing the equation. It's y is equals to zero point four nine x plus twelve point four one. Remember the twelve point four one here is actually a y-intercept. So y is equals to 0 0.49x plus 12.41. This is a y-intercept. Now, y-intercept is found when x is 0. But then in context to this, this means that a learner that did not even start writing the exam uh, will get 12.41, right, as their mark. Now, it is not possible that you will not have picked up an exam and then you get marks. We know that if you are not present to write the exam, then you are supposed to have zero, right? So our line of best fit should have started from zero here. So our y-intercept should have been zero. But then the fact that our line of best fit will be starting somewhere from there, this means that it is not reliable because this means that uh, if, you, if you did not write the exam at all, you are going to get 12.41%, which doesn't make sense. So we invalidate this by saying, so 2.1, we are going to say the y-intercept, the y-intercept is 12.41, right? Which means, which means, Elena, who did not begin to write, is 
the exam will achieve a 12.41 percent which is impossible if you if you didn't uh, write the exam then you won't receive any marks right so that's it then 2.4 says calculate the standard deviation of the top 10 mathematics learners so for standard deviation we need our calculator once again so go to our calculator and then again uh, we have shift then one so we go to variable this time and then we are looking for this so calculate the standard deviation of the top 10 mathematics learners right the top 10 math okay top 10 mathematics learners the learners was y so that means i must look for a uh, the standard deviation of y so that's number six so in punching that i get 10.28 so be careful what they're looking for. They're not looking for the standard deviation of the average time, but the standard deviation of the mathematics marks. So that's 10.28. So that's our standard deviation of Y. Okay, now uh, 2.5 says it is further given that p is to 103.59 is the interval of 15 random learners marks within one standard deviation of the mean if the mean is 63.96 calculate the value of p so now we are given that the mean is 63.96 and then once it says within one standard deviation understand this within one standard deviation means we have x bar is to uh, our standard deviation and then we also have x bar plus the standard deviation so this is within one standard deviation so that means it can be one standard deviation below or one standard deviation above the mean within one standard deviation now what are they saying we must calculate the value of p right now we are given a uh, this so we can say x bar minus the standard deviation must be equal to p because this is represented in a form of coordinates right but then again x bar plus the standard deviation should be equals to 103.59 now we get this so this relates to p and then this here relates to x bar plus uh, that right so this is one standard deviation below the mean and this is one standard deviation above the mean right so below mean and then this is above mean okay so having this remember we do have the x bar meaning we can calculate the standard deviation by saying 63.96 plus a uh, standard deviation is equals to 103.59 now to calculate our standard deviation is just a matter of taking this over to that side so we have standard deviation is equals to 103.59 minus a uh, 63.96 and then we get our value is 39.63 meaning that uh, using that we can now calculate the value of p so the value of p will be obtained by saying our x bar again is 63.96 but then we already have the standard deviation it's 39.63 and that will be equal to p now you just simply grab your calculator and say 63.96 uh, minus 36.63 and then you get your value of p Therefore, your value of P is going to be 27, 27.33, right? So that's how we have it. That's how we have it. And then, nice.
Okay, so 11 marks for all of that. And then we are done with uh, stats. So a very tiring topic. Then uh, collecting all those marks on your stats, you have 11 marks here. And then add it to the nine marks there. So stats in total will be 20 marks. So make sure that you practice the, that statistics. Do not uh, go with the mindset that statistics is simple. Uh, there are some questions that might be a bit tricky, especially if you don't understand uh, the terminologies that they're using there. So make sure that you practice and you just make sure that you get all of that 20 marks there. And then um, we are good. So question three now, we are starting with our analytical geometry. It says in the diagram, in the diagram below point A, 5 is to 0 and B7 is to 6 and PX is to Y form a triangle where BP is equal to AP and E is the midpoint of AB, right? Then determine the coordinates of E. We've been told that uh, E is the midpoint of AB. So that means uh, to calculate the coordinates of E, we have to pull up our uh, midpoint formula. So this is M. Okay, let's just say E. So this being our midpoint, and then we are simply going to say x1 plus x2 over 2 is to y1 plus y2 over 2. Mm -hmm. Then our x1 can say 5 plus 7 over 2. And then here we have uh, 0 plus 6 over 2. Now 5 plus 7 is giving us 12. Then 12 divided by 2 will give us a uh, 6, right? So this is 6 and then 6 divided by 2, that's 3. So that means our coordinate for E uh, is 6 is 2, 3. So 2 marks for that. 2 marks for that. So they mark, they mark each and every coordinate finding 6 and 3. Okay, then nice. Now we proceed to 3.2. It says determine the equation of line BA. Equation of line BA. Now we know BA is a straight line. And in order to determine the equation of a straight line, uh, this is in the form of Y equals to MX plus C. You need the gradient and you also need the Y intercept, right? So we can start by calculating the gradient. It's just Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. So what is your Y2? Uh, you can take it as 6 and then minus 0. And then what is your X2? Uh, can say 7 minus 5. So this is 6, and then 7 minus 5 is 2, 6 divided by 2. This will give us 3. So our gradient is 3. And then from here on, we can uh, pull up this formula here, y is equals to y1, and then mx minus x1. Some of you might decide to use this formula and find uh, c here by substituting any one of these coordinates. It is also correct, guys. Then here, I'm just going to choose any set of coordinates. Let's say I go with uh, A. So this is Y minus 0. Then my gradient is 3. Then X. Then I'm going to substitute 5 there. So this is going to be Y. Y minus 0 is just Y. 3 times X is 3X. Three, 3 times negative 5, that's negative 15. Then voila, I have my equation. Then, okay, they will mark the gradient. They will mark your substitution into either this formula or that formula, and then they will mark your equation. Okay, so now we have that. Then uh, let's check. 3.3 says line BA is parallel to the straight line with equation Rx minus 3y plus y, and then calculate the value of R, right? So obviously, uh, the first thing that we can try to do here is write this in standard form so that we have it in the form of y is equals to mx plus c. So this is y is equals to, uh, I mean, we want to leave this negative. We have rx minus 3y plus 5 is equals to 0. can take the rx, transpose it over to that side. So we have negative 3y. And then is equals to negative Rx. And along with this positive 5, it will be negative 5. And then now, if I want to write this in the form of y is equals to mx plus c, I do understand that I have to divide everything throughout by negative 3. 
So this becomes y is equals to negative and negative is positive. So I have uh, r over 3 and then x. And then here, the negative and negative is also positive. So plus 5 over 3. But then remember now, this that we are seeing here is representing the gradient, right? And then what is it that we know about the gradient of parallel lines? We know that parallel lines have the same gradient. So if BA is parallel to this straight line, that means the gradient of BA is equal to the gradient of the straight line. So what is the gradient of BA? We did calculate it above. We found that the gradient is 3. So that means that this R over 3 here must be equal to 3. Then I uh, will say, uh, in other words, 3 is equal to R over 3 because it represents the gradient. So this is the gradient. The gradient of this straight line is R over 3. But then the gradient of BA is 3, so that's why we are substituting with 3 there. Then if we cross multiply here, this is going to be 9. So our R is equal to 9. Just as easy as that. So 3 marks. Now, they marked that you got this into standard form. And then, uh, okay, standard form is this one here. So having this in standard form, it's a mark. And then having to identify that your gradient can be equated to 3, it's a mark. And then having to find your value of R, it's a mark. Right, so 3 marks. Now, 3.4, we have a very interesting question there for 7 marks, right? All right, so we have a 3.4. It says if the area of triangle AOP is 10 units and your Y, so it's 10 units square, and then your y has to be less than zero. Calculate the coordinates of p. So y less than zero means that your y coordinate here has to be a negative. We can see that because it's below the x-axis. So we do understand why it needs to be negative. Then here it says calculate the coordinates of p for seven months. So whenever you see a seven mark question in paper two, you know you have to really, really roll up your sleeves. Then, okay, let's uh, check here how we can tackle this question. So I will try to minimize so that I have much space to answer that. Okay, so um, we are given that the area of triangle AOP is 10 units, but then we can see that our AOP here is not a complete triangle. So that means it is up to us to come and construct that. Remember, this is allowed in a question paper, guys. This is analytical geometry. And then you'll be given an answer book whereby you can be able to show all of this. So you remember the instruction was telling us that if necessary, you can indicate diagrams or even drawings to illustrate uh, whatever the point you are trying to make. Then, okay, this is triangle AOP. And then uh, from here, we are given uh, that our area is 10 units. But then we can see that this is a weirdly shaped uh, triangle. So we can try to, uh, if we have a triangle like this, you do understand that if we wanted to calculate the area here, using our formula area is equal to half base times height, because that's the, that's the formula for the area of a triangle. We would then have to construct a perpendicular height, right? So this is the perpendicular height that would be used that would be used along with this base here. So it would be base half base times the perpendicular height. So we can do the same thing here and construct our own perpendicular height, right? So this is a scale that you will need uh, on Tuesday because most of your triangles there, if they want you to calculate the area, then you must be in a position whereby you can construct a perpendicular height. So you have to check this one very careful. So this is perpendicular height like that. Now, if you can see the perpendicular height exactly matches up with the value of Y there. So that means if we find the perpendicular height, the length of the perpendicular height, we can use that length as the Y coordinate of P. So which is why we are tackling uh, that question based on that perpendicular height. So, okay, now we have area is equal to half base times height. But then remember, we are given the value for the area is 10. And then the base, the base we are talking about is this here, right? So if you can look at this triangle, it's similar to that. It's just that it is now flipped over. 
right? So the base, it's from O to A, which is five units in between. So the base is five, and then multiply that by our perpendicular height. Now this is 10, and then half of five is 2.5, and then multiply by the perpendicular height. If you want the perpendicular height, we have to divide both sides by 2.5. So our perpendicular height uh, now becomes four units, right? But then now pay attention to this. They said where your y must be less than zero. So your y must be negative. So we do understand that our perpendicular height is a length of four units. But then in terms of the y value, we must conclude that therefore our y value is equals to negative four. So that means the coordinates of P are actually X is 2, negative 4. We still have a challenge of finding X here. But then if we go back here, note that everything that you are given uh, in analytical geometry actually aids in helping you to calculate uh, whatever that you are given. Remember here we were given that BP is equals to AP, which we can see here. Now we can see that the X here or the coordinates of P are actually a midpoint between BP, I mean, not a midpoint, a, a point of intersection. That's what I meant to say. A point of intersection between BP and AP. So this is where BP and AP join, right? So this is the point where they meet. So now what can we use uh, for that? Remember, we are given that the lengths are the same. So anything that relates to the length, we know that we now have to use the what? The distance formula. So in other words, you can agree with me if I say that if I have uh, the size of BP, it will exactly be equal to the size of AP, as we are being told here, which means that BP squared would still be equal to AP squared, right? Because if, for example, we have 5, we say 5 squared is 25, and then even here, 5 squared is 25. So, but then why are we using that? It's because we now want to manipulate this into a distance formula. So by saying BP squared, I will then be saying, this can be written as X2 minus X1 square plus Y2 minus Y1 square, which will be equal to X2 minus X1 square plus y2 minus y1 square, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in substituting here, uh, for this side, I will be using BP. So my x2, let it be the coordinates of P, right? And then remember the coordinates of P, we do have them here. For x2, I only have x because I haven't got the x coordinate of P. Then minus uh, the 7 here, and then square that. Then we have our y value. Remember, we did calculate it's negative 4. So we'll say minus 6 and then square that. So this here will give us, if we check AP now, remember for this side, it's AP squared. So again, we're going to say x minus 5 square, then plus uh, it's y. So the y is negative 4, negative 4 minus 0, and then square that. Now, if we expand this, this will be x squared minus 14x, then plus 49. So already I've done the foiling here. And then this is negative 4 minus 6, which is negative 10. Negative 10 squared is 100. And then this here will give me x squared uh, minus 10x, then plus 25. Again, I've done the foiling already. And plus... The negative 4 minus 0 is negative 4. Negative 4 squared is 16. And then from this part, I can say x squared minus 14x. 49 plus 100 is 149. And then that side, I have x squared minus 10x. Then 25 plus 16 is 41. Right. Now, we can tell that, obviously, the x squared and the x squared will cancel out there. So the x squared and the x squared will cancel out. So we'll be left with negative 14x, which we can transpose this negative 10. It will be plus 10x. Now I can say 41 minus 149. Then if I do this, this will give me negative 4x. And then this here, negative 108. If I divide both sides by negative 4, negative 4, my x is equals to 27. 
Right. So that means in other words, I can then conclude that the coordinates for P are actually 27 is 2, negative 4. So that's how you were supposed to go about answering that question for seven marks. So it was not a very difficult question. You just needed to understand what is done. Also to put in mind that if you are given something, a statement from above, then it will definitely apply. So you saw that from 3.1 all the way to 3.3, you did not choose the fact that BP is equal to AP, which is a valid statement. So you needed to also uh, put that in mind that oh i haven't used this statement maybe this is the point whereby i need to actually consider that so if you are interested on where the marks were allocated uh, there was a mark for here having to express this like that and then there was a mark for finding a perpendicular height as four units and then also concluding that your y therefore is negative four and then having to write this like that, this side, and then this like that, this side. So now you are at about five marks. So uh, the other mark was having to get to this point here. And then the final mark was finding your answer, of course, for X. Then that's your seven marks, right? So if you had, had you only done up until this point, you only found Y, then you, you have three out of seven. So which is not a uh, very bad, at least you worked out with something, but then always aim to get uh, all the questions correct if you are able to. Then we have question four, still analytical geometry, this time with circles. The diagram below shows a circle with center B, A is to B, BP is parallel to the Y axis with P on the X axis, AS is a tangent to circle B, at a uh, negative 2 is 2, 4 and intersect the x-axis at F, at S and y-axis at R. AE is a tangent to the smaller circle with center D and touches the circle at E and then our ORS is 45 degrees. Now they say for four marks, determine the equation of the tangent AS, right? So now you have to understand, remember, you are allowed to just construct in here so we can say, let's assume that this here will be our alpha. And then since we are given that this is 45, and then from here, this is a vertical line and a horizontal line, we know that at the origin, we wanna have 90 degrees. So if this is a triangle here, then we know that we have 45 degrees here, meaning that our alpha would actually have to be, uh, the alpha there would actually have to be 135 degrees. It's either you can use the fact that it's an exterior angle of a triangle, or you can use lines or uh, angles on a straight line. So I will say 135 degrees because of exterior angle of triangle. We know that from this, an exterior angle of a triangle is equal to two opposite interior angles. Okay, so now our alpha is 135 degrees. So to determine the equation of tangent AS now, remember for the equation, it's Y is equals to MX plus C. So we need the gradient and we also need the, uh, the Y intercept, right? So, okay, for that, we can say to find the gradient, we already know tan alpha is equals to gradient, right? From using the angle of inclination. So this is tan 135 degrees, is equal to the gradient. And then our gradient here, if we calculate, is going to be negative one. Now, in order to find our equation of the straight line, we know the formula y minus y1 is equal to mx minus x1. So this is y minus, we can use the coordinates of a, since we are looking for a s, and the only coordinates we are provided with are the coordinates of a. So we have four here, our gradient is negative one, then x. We have negative two, so which will be minus, minus, it's plus two here. So this is y is equals to negative x and negative two. Then if we transpose the negative four, it's plus four. So our equation is actually negative x plus two. So negative two plus four is positive two. And then that's how we were supposed to get that one. Then uh, for four marks, they marked uh, 
they marked having to say turn 135 and then having to find your gradient as negative one and then uh, substituting the coordinates negative two is to four and then also finding your equation okay okay so we have 4.2 it says if op is four units determine the value of a and b the center of the larger circle so we want to determine the coordinates of uh, the larger circle here and then from here we can see that uh, op we've been given that it is four units so from here to here it is actually four units right so this is a straight line which corresponds uh, to the value of a so if this is four units to the left uh, then we know that our a actually has to be negative four because it's on the negative x-axis so that means we have to now find b but then looking at this here we can tell that this is a radius that is intersecting with what with a tangent now we always know the relationship of tan and the radius so we know that tan is actually perpendicular to the radius so which means the gradient of bp the radius times the gradient so it's not actually bp the radius is not bp so let's say uh, the gradient of the radius okay so tangent is as let's start with as and then times the gradient of the radius has to give us negative one but we already have the gradient of as right mm -hmm. we did calculate it previously and then we found that it was negative one so if we say times the gradient of the radius negative one if we divide both sides by negative one then the gradient of the radius has to be equal to positive one right now we can simply use that fact in order to calculate uh, the values of b right or the value of b here by saying uh, the gradient of the gradient of the radius a b which is this here radius a b is equals to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 right well gradient is one and then y2 we can take it as a uh, the a here which is negative okay as b remember it's y um we can take it as that b there then minus four and then x2 we can take it as the a which was negative four and then there will be minus x1 which is negative two so minus negative two right so this will give us one is equals to b minus four from here if we punch this into our calculator that's negative four plus two which will give us a negative two if we cross multiply here this is negative two is equals to b minus four and then if we transpose the four over to this side it will be negative two plus four which is positive two so that means uh, we have our b as two so that means the whole coordinates of b are actually a uh, negative four is to positive two right so those become uh, the coordinates of the center of the largest circle so your a value is negative four and your b value is positive two that's how you were supposed to go about answering that one okay let's now go to 4.3 says determine the equation of the circle with center b determine the equation of the circle with center b we already have the coordinates of the circle says x minus so b let's write the coordinates of b they were negative four uh, and two so we know the equation is x minus a square plus y minus b square and then it's equals to r squared so this is the standard formula for the circle then since we have the value of a we can say x plus four so remember it's negative times the negative it's positive and then now we have y minus two square is equals to r squared but then obviously we do need to find the distance of r squared here so in order to do that this is when we can substitute a uh, the values of a into the equation so let's say x will be negative two and then plus four square and then here we'll have four minus two square 
is equals to r squared. Now, if you punch that into your calculator, you will definitely get a 8 and then r squared. So your r squared is equals to 8, meaning now you can write your equation as x plus 4 square plus y minus 2 square and then is equals to 8. Right. Remember here we want the value of r squared. So this here becomes your equation. This here becomes your equation. Okay, so that was only for three marks. 4.4. It says the equation of the smaller circuit with center D is x squared minus 2x plus y squared minus 2y is equals to 0. Write this equation in the form of x minus a squared plus y minus b squared is equals to r squared. Now, this is easy peasy, guys. This is how you do this. So all you have to check here, you have x squared minus 2x then plus y squared minus 2y is equals to 0. You simply open two brackets then plus here, yeah, like that, then equal. Now, you're going to put your x in here, then you're going to put your y in here. Then you go to this one, the one with uh, the one with your x being uh, having a degree of 1 here. So you are looking at the coefficient of that x there, and then you can see it's negative 2. Now you want to find a way to divide that, right? So what is a uh, negative 2 divided by 2, right? So every time you are dividing that value, there, the coefficient, by 2, and then you will get negative 1. Then you simply put it, it you, you put it here, and then you say square. Now again, you come to this one here. This is negative 2. Then if you say negative 2 divided by 2, again, you get negative 1. So you put your negative 1 here, and then you square. But then remember, you've been finding negative 1. If you transpose the negative 1s over to this side, they become positive, both of them. So it's 1 plus 1. Now this will become x minus 1 square plus y minus 1 square. And then what's 1 plus 1? That's equal to 2. Then just like that, you have your equation of uh, the smaller circuit. Right. So done. So where are your marks? Where are your marks? It's a mark for having to find this. It's a mark for having to find this. And then it's a mark for having to find 2 here. Okay, now 4.5 says write down the coordinates of D, the center of the smaller circle. Now we do understand that D there is the center. But then what do we get from this? If they say D is the center of the smaller circle, we know that this coordinates here are actually representing the coordinates of the center. So we want to say our D is actually positive 1 is to 1. Remember, we don't take it along. We don't take this sign here because actually the formula is x minus a square plus y minus b square is equals to r squared. The coordinates of the center D are actually a is to b. So obviously, if we have minus 1 here, we know that a is positive 1. And then if we have minus 1 here, we know that B is actually positive 1. So it's only one mark. Then D is 1 is to 1. Then calculate the length of AE, the tangent to circle D at E. So the length of AE. How many marks? 6 marks. Again, we have to roll up our sleeves here. Roll up our sleeves. Okay, uh, AE, well, let's try to minimize this. So AE is a tangent to D at E. So this is our AE, which is a tangent. Now we know that what could help us here is uh, actually joining this and then when we join this, we know that this is a radius which is usually perpendicular to the tangent. So always radius perpendicular to tangent. So if they mention anything on the tangent, you know that it has to relate to that. But then if you can check what I've done already there by joining those, is that now I have a what? A right angle triangle. Now if you have a right angle triangle, 
this allows you to use Pythagoras theorem, right? Now, what is our DE, right? DE is the radius. But then remember, we had our equation in 4.4 as what? So the standard equation is like this. With R squared, and then we had X minus 1 square plus Y minus 1, and then it's a square, and then 2. So meaning that we can actually find the length of DE, the radius, by saying that uh, it's not equal to 2 because what's equal to 2 is actually the radius squared. So a lot of you get this one confused. So your DE is actually equal to the radius. That means I would need to square both sides here to get my radius as root 2 which would then mean that therefore DE is equals to root 2. So now I have root 2 here. Uh, let's substitute in here. So DE uh, is root 2. What am I doing? So we have root 2 here. But then what are we looking for? We are looking for the length of AE. So again, we can look for the length of AO if we want to use the Pythagoras theorem. Then AO, we can simply calculate uh, the distance of, uh, not AO, a AD, sorry for that. I'm used to O being the cent. Then AD, which is from here all the way up to here. So let's calculate the length of AD by saying, obviously our distance formula x x2 minus x1 square plus y2 minus y1 and then square. Okay, then uh, this will be what, remember we do have the coordinates of D here, is 1 is to 1. We did uh, calculate that one there. So that means we will have 1 minus negative 2, which is 1 plus 2, and then square that. And then also again, we'll have 1 minus the 4 here, and then square that. Now, if you punch all this into your calculator, you are supposed to get, so this is a 9, so 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 square is 9, so we're going to have 9, 1 minus 4 is 9, is 3, negative 3, 3 square is also 9, so we are going to have root 18. So you can just punch it out into your calculator. So root 18, if you punch it into your calculator, it simplifies to 3 root 2. So this is for someone who just punched it from here. Remember, there are no marks for this. You can just move from here and then just punch everything into your calculator. You get 3 root 2. So, okay, let's put it here. You have 3 root 2. Now, using our Pythagorean theorem, we know that it says that r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. Our r squared being the hypotenuse. Now, the hypotenuse is always the side that is facing the 90 degree angle, which means it's this. So that means we can have AD square is equals to, we can take this one as our X, so that will be DE squared. And then our Y can be the AE that we are looking for, AE squared. Now, I'll allow me to just uh, manipulate it, or let me just substitute like this. AD is 3 root 2 square, and then DE is a uh, root 2, and then square. Then we have our AE squared, right? So you want to punch this into your calculator here. And then you are going to get 18. And then also you want to punch this. You will get 2. And then AE square. Now your AE square, we can say 18 minus 2 now, which will give you what? Uh, 16. So 16, and then you have to square both sides to find the AE. Therefore, your length for AE is actually what? four units four units there you go so four units so yep again it was not a very difficult question all you needed to uh, understand there is that every time they mention anything to do uh, with the tangent it is best to just uh, join your tangent to the to the radius so that they form that 90 degrees and then eventually you can now see that you created a triangle there which you can then use to your own advantage to calculate AE using the Pythagoras theorem. So these are the tricks that you want to actually have before you can uh, write your paper too, right? Okay, so now 
at this point you have 21 marks from here so let's check marks we have 21 and then plus the 15 from here plus the 20 from stats then at this point we are sitting at 56 marks so with paper two if you answer all the way from question one up until question four you now have 30 percent almost 30 plus percent of the paper right and then now it's time for you to uh, check on your uh, trigonometry right so it says 5.1 calculate the value of 1 minus 4 sine squared 15 degrees without the use of a calculator so okay we understand that 15 here is not a special angle if we are not to use a calculator then then that means we need to write this in terms of special angles so we must find a way in which we can write 15 in terms of our special angles special angles are your 30 degrees 45 degrees and then 60 degrees right so these are the primary a uh, special angles so you want to actually write this 15 degrees in terms of that so you do understand that if we say 45 minus 30 that's 15 and then even if we say 60 minus 45 that's uh, also 15. so you can write it as 45 minus 30 or 60 minus 45 it is a uh, clearly your choice right then this is one minus four sine a square 15 degrees and then we're going to try to break down this so that it is now in terms of our compound angle so this is 45 degrees minus 30 degrees right now at this point we do understand that now we have a compound angle of sine right so whereby we can now say this is one minus four and then in bracket we will have sine 45 so if you do understand the whole uh, thing from your from your formula sheet which goes sine a minus b is equals to sine and then a uh, a then followed by what cos b and then it's minus cos a and then sine b so this is based on that the compound angles so this is sine 45 if we are using that this is sine 45 and then will be followed by cos 30 then minus now it will start with cos 45 and then we close it off with sine 30. so that's exactly what we are doing there but then now the 45 and the 30 are special angles note that we have square so we must not forget that square then this is one minus four in bracket what is sine 45 we know that sine 45 is root 2 over 2. now they won't be able to tell if you use the calculator or not so you can simply just punch this into the calculate right at this point you can use a calculate the restriction to not use the calculator is saying don't just take this and punch it all into your calculator you need to break it down according to what we have taught you in trigonomate but then it does not prohibit you from using the calculator after you have done that so understand that instruction then this is root 2 over 2 minus our cos 45 is root 2 over 2 and then here we have 1 over 2 but then again let's not forget we have square there right so you want to deal with whatever that's inside the bracket here so you can just punch it into your calculator it becomes a uh, root 6 over 2 and then here we will have what root 2 okay root uh, root so if we do all of this let me just punch all of this so this will be that over 4 right because the 2 times 2 will give me 4 and then uh, from here also let's not forget we still have that square there now if we square what's inside the brackets here we will end up with 1 minus 4 and then in brackets uh, we're still going to have 8 minus 4 root 3 over 60 so all of these answers i'm getting from the calculator and then uh, at this point now you can try to multiply inside with the 4 if you multiply inside with the 4 this is going to give you 1 minus uh, 
8 minus 4 root 3 over 4. Now you do understand that the 4 here will be dividing the 16 here. So 4 goes how many times into 16? 4 times. That's why we have a 4 here. Now if you punch all this into your calculator, you will get root 3 minus 1. So that's the answer that you get from your calculator. Okay, cool. Then uh, that's it. That's it. Then let's go to 5.2. 5 5 Say simplify without the use of a calculator. Root 3 sine x sine squared 72 plus uh, sine squared 198. And then we have uh, root 3 cos x minus uh, 90 degrees, right? So also this one, let's make space. So we have our root 3 sine x sine squared 72 degrees plus sine squared 198 degrees. And then root 3 cos x minus 90 degrees all over a ton. 120 degrees and then sine x right now at this point you want to deal with this and then uh, we're going to have root 3 sine x there's nothing we can do with that but then the 72 there is a way in which we can reduce that by simply saying sine squared 90 minus 18 degrees and then which we can also do with the sine squared 198 we can say this is 180 plus 18 degrees. Remember the purpose of this is we want to end up with the same angle. Then multiply by what? Root uh, 3. Now this is cos x minus 90 degrees, which indicates a negative angle. But then we also know that 90 minus x is a form of a what? A core function. So the core function of cos is sine, right? But since we know that cos of a negative angle is a positive, that means if in our core function will be positive, so it will be sine x. So we we are done with that. And then we have tan 120. The tan 120, we can also break it down. And then to say 180 minus 60, which will create a special angle, then sine x. Okay. Now at this point, we have our root 3 sine x and then sine in the first quadrant, we know it's positive. So this will just change to its core function because it's 90 minus. Remember, whenever we have 90 minus x or 90 plus x, the sine and cos, they change to, it, it, to the core function. So this is supposed to change to cos squared 18. So remember that. And then here we have sine 180 plus 18. We know that a uh, sine in the third quadrant is negative. But then now, because of the square here, even if it comes out as a negative, negative times negative will be a positive. So it will not uh, affect the sine. So this will just come out as sine squared 18. So always note that whenever we have a square, even if it's negative on that quadrant, it comes out as a positive because of the negative times negative. Then here we have root 3 sine x. Nice. So we are getting somewhere now. Then tan 180 minus 60. This is in the second quadrant. 180 minus theta is the second quadrant. How is tan in the second quadrant? It is negative. So this is supposed to be negative tan 60 degrees. And then here we have sine x. So little by little, you are breaking it down. Now, if you can check the numerator here, you will see that, oh, we have a common factor of root 3 sine x. So let's factor out our common fact. Root 3 sine x, and then bracket, we have cos squared 18 degrees plus sine squared 18 degrees, right? Now, 60 degrees is a special angle, meaning we can punch this into our calculator immediately. So negative tan, tan 60 is negative root 3. Then we have negative root 3 sine x. Wow, what happened here? Now we can see that we can cancel out these ones because uh, they are actually 
uh, the same, right? Denominator, numerator, uh, the same. So that means at that point, you can say, let them divide out. But then here from the numerator, we are seeing something. If you can still remember cos squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to one, right? It, this is exactly what we are seeing here. So this is equal to one. So this is negative one. Okay, so now we are 5.3. It says uh, determine the general solution of the following. So 6 uh, sine x cos x plus 3 cos x minus 4 sine squared x minus 2 sine x is equals to 0. Then we are to determine the general formula of this. So uh, looking at this one here, you can see that if we can just try to uh, get a common factor from this here. So I think this is a question on grouping. So let's try it out. So we have our 3 cos x and then bracket 2 sin x would be able to make the 6 sin x cos x back. And then here, uh, if we have this one here will be one then if we try to group these ones again the common factor would be two sine x and then here would end up with two sine x but then here uh, this would be plus one equal to zero now we can see that we have a common factor so meaning we can write this as three cos x minus two sine x into one bracket. And then since this is a common factor, we're also going to write that into one bracket. So this is factorizing by grouping. Now that now that we have uh, two equations like this, can try to calculate. So let me start with the easier one here. Two sine x plus one is equals to zero. Or this side, we have three cos x minus two sine x will be equal to zero. So this will be 2 sine x is equal to negative 1, which if we divide both sides by 2, our sine x will be equal to negative 1. Now the negative here is telling us that we must choose a quadrant whereby we have our sign being negative. So that means the quadrant we are going with for the solutions of this one will be uh, the third quadrant and also the fourth quadrant. Then when we come to this one, we have 3 cos x and then is equals to 2 sine x. Now, once we have cos and sine, we know that we have, this is where we create our tan. So this is tan type. So we can create that by dividing both sides by a cos, right? Not sine, by dividing both sides by a cos because we know that tan is sine x over cos x. Then there we go. This will cancel out, so we have 3. But then sine x over cos x will change this to tan x. And then we can now divide by 2 both sides. So this will give us tan x is equals to 3 over 2. Now it's a positive, so that means we would have to find our uh, solutions here. On the Where is our tan positive? So our tan is positive in the first quadrant and also in the third quadrant. So the solutions for tan will be uh, obtained in the first and the third quadrant. Now, obviously, we need our reference angles. So for sine x is equal to negative 1 over 2. To calculate our reference angle, we simply say, remember, you ignore the negative if you have to calculate uh, the reference angle. So ignore the negative. The negative is only pointing you to the quadrant that you need to use. Now, if you say what is a sine arc sine 1 over 2, this gives us a reference angle of 30 degrees. So let's note, this is ref angle. Now, to find the solutions under a sine, then we can say second quadrant, third quadrant, meant to say, because we're going to check on the third quadrant and fourth. So this will go as x is equals to 180 plus the reference angle, which is 30 degrees, then plus k360. So 180 plus 30 degrees, that's 210 degrees, plus K360. And then uh, number four, we have X is equals to 360 minus the reference angle again of 30 degrees, plus K360. 
Now our solutions for this one, it's 330 degrees plus K360. And then don't forget to mention where K is an element of integers, right? So where K is an element of integers, always when you are done. Then we are done with the solutions of a sine. Then let's look for the solutions of tan. So um, let me just erase this part because we are done. Only when I leave that tan x is equals to 3 over 2. So this is tan x is equals to 3 over 2. To get the reference angle, again, I must say arctan 3 over 2. And then I get my reference angle as a 56.31 degrees rounded off to two decimal places. So I will say this is my reference angle. Then I must get my solutions on the, on the first and the third quadrant. When it comes to the first quadrant, guys, do not use 90 minus the reference angle. On the first quadrant, it is exactly your reference angle plus K180. Remember, it's tan. The period for tan is 180 degrees. So in the first quadrant, I will just say, this is X is equals to 56.31 degrees plus K180 degrees, where K is an element of integers. Then we go to the fourth quadrant. I mean, third quadrant. Why do I keep on saying fourth? Third quadrant. Then this is X is 180 plus our reference angle of 53, 56.31, and then plus K180 degrees. Then if we add those ones up, this is 236.31 degrees plus K180 degrees, where we say K is an element of integers, right? So, okay, those are the solutions that we have for both tan and a sine, right? So for seven marks, that's how you needed to determine the general solution. So general solutions are generally not that difficult. You just need to understand what needs to be done. Okay, so nice. Now let's proceed. We have 5.4. It says prove that 1 minus tan A and then bracket cos A over cos 2A is equal to cos A plus sine A. And then all that for four marks. So pretty interesting question. This is where we have to prove that our left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. Okay, so let's see how we get to this part. So we have 1 minus tan A and then bracket cos A over a double angle here, which is cos 2A, which makes it very interesting, right? Interesting. Then, okay, we can choose to break down our tan A here as 1 minus sine A over cos A. And then again, uh, seeing that we are dealing with a lot of cos cos, uh, so we have cos and sine. Let's try to break this one down here. 2 cos squared A minus sine squared A. So you still remember your double uh, angle identities. So if you have cos 2A, it can be broken down to cos squared A minus sine squared A. Or it can be 2 cos squared A uh, minus 1. Or it can be 1 minus 2 sine squared A. So now I'm choosing to deal with this one because I'm seeing sine and cos there. Right. So also here, looking at this one here, there's cos A plus sine A. So it's congruent to what I'm looking for. Then uh, at this point, we can say uh, this here. Remember, we are dealing with this one here. We can write the one as one over one and kind of deal with this one here with our Karate method. So this is cos A. Uh, cos A times 1 will be cos A. And then 1 times uh, sine A will be sine A. And then this is over what? Cos A. So you do agree this here can be written as that. And then times cos A over uh, the cos squared A minus sine squared A. Note that this is a difference of two squares. So it can be written as cos A minus sine A. And then in bracket, cos A plus sine A, right? So it's a difference of two squares. Um, let me make space and write it properly. Then remember, from this, I got that it's cos A from saying cos A times one. And then one times sine A, it's minus sine A. And then the denominator, I just say one times cos A. And then that's over cos A. 
So what I've written here, it's similar to this. It's just that now I have uh, simplified. Then I said that this here is a difference of two squares, which I can have cos A over down here, cos A minus sine A multiplied by cos A plus sine A. Right. So these are the tricks that you need to know for your paper. Then the cos A and the cos A can cancel out. And then uh, obviously we'll be left with the cos A minus sine A as the enumerator. And then on the denominator, I have cos A minus sine A. And then cos A plus sine A. Then this can divide out with that. So we will be left with 1 over cos A plus sine A. So correct. Now, remember from here we were proving from the left-hand side. It is very important to indicate that you were proving from the left-hand side. But then once you get to this point, you then say, therefore, your left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. Okay. Cake, cake, cake. It's just a small piece of cake. Then 5.5 uh, says if sine 2 theta is equals to k and your your 2 theta is in between 0 degrees to 90 degrees, determine in terms of k cos 2 theta. So uh, we always know how to deal with this one. The first thing that you need to indicate is obviously your Cartesian plane and try to draw that uh, right angle triangle so they said it's between 0 to 90 degrees that means our drawing should be on the first quadrant like that and then we have our two theta will be indicated here that's the angle and then remember the sine two theta here is equals to k should be expressed as k over one and then considering soccer tower we know that sine is opposite of our hypotenuse. So that means the K represents our opposite and our one here represents our hypotenuse. So obviously, the first thing that we need to do is fill in here. So we can fill that one X squared by saying it's R squared minus a Y squared, which is supposed to be one square minus a K square, which is one minus K square. But because we are looking for X and not X squared, we have to put this one inside the bracket, uh, I mean inside the square root, and then this is 1 minus k squared. So you have the value for that. Now, after finding that, you can now focus on solving your questions. So we are given that sine 2 theta is that. How can we find cos 2 theta? We can uh, simply get it from using this here. So cos, remember, it's adjacent of a hypotenuse. So that means for 5.5.1, we're just going to say adjacent. So cos 2 theta is our adjacent side, which is root 1 minus k squared over our hypotenuse side, which is 1. So all of this will just give you 1 minus uh, k squared. Right. So correct. Now, um, we can then go for 5.5.2 and then say sine 2 theta over tan theta. Now, how are we going to get this? We can simply uh, use the fact that we do have our sine 2 theta here is k, right? But if we have to solve this further, we have sine 2 theta over tan theta. Let's try to break this one down here. So this will lead us to what? So sine 2 theta, remember, it's a, it's a double angle, which breaks down to 2 sine theta and then cos theta, right? So this will give us 2 sine theta, uh, cos theta. Then we can say divided by tan theta because over tan theta is the same as divided by tan theta, which would lead us to 2 sine theta and then cos theta. Uh, this, remember, becomes sine theta over cos theta, right? Which we can further do this by reciprocating this. So if we do reciprocal, we know that denominator becomes numerator and numerator becomes denominator. So now at the end of the day, we have sine theta canceling off with that sine theta. And then we are left with 2 cos squared theta, right? So 2 cos squared theta 
is our solution for this. But then here is something smart that we are going to do. I need you to pay attention to this. So you need this trick. So note that here, we are given this in terms of two theta here. So we can't just find our turn theta from this uh, triangle here because our angle is actually two theta and not theta. So that's why we had to manipulate up until this point. But then remember, from previously, we have our cos two theta. And then from our knowledge of uh, double angle identities, we know that cos two theta can also be written as two cos squared theta minus one. Now, what was our solution here? We had our solution. That's it. It's root one minus k square, right? And then two cos squared theta. Uh, that's what we have here. That's the value for this. So in other words, by looking for this, we are actually looking for two cos squared theta. So this is two cos squared theta and then minus one, meaning we can take the one over to that side. So the two cos squared theta the two cos squared theta, the two cos squared theta is equals to root one minus k squared plus one, right? Remember the one here is a constant. We cannot put it inside the square root there. So that's your answer. So why is it uh, that we found this? It's because when we calculated here, we actually find that sine two theta over tan theta is equals to that two cos squared theta. Meaning if we find the solution of this, we have found the solution for that. So the solution for this one here, therefore, is also root one minus k squared plus one. So that's how you were supposed to go about uh, tackling that question there. So it was a pretty nice question to deal with. So five marks for that. Now, if you can add it to the 56 that we already had, uh, plus the 29 here, we are at uh, 85. So which means if you answer from question one to uh, question five, you have already surpassed half of the marks, right? So 85 divided by 150, uh, that's about 56%. So answering all the way from question one to question five, you already have about 50% of the question. So if you want to pass the exam, I can make sure that you know all your questions from question one up until question four, right? Then you can just uh, grab a few from that question five, and then also your question six is not that very difficult uh, trick functions. So know where your marks are again, know where your strength lies, and then where you can collect marks. Then question six uh, trick functions, says the sketch below shows the graph of f of x is equals to a sine x and g of x is cos dx for x element of negative 180 degrees to positive 180 degrees as we can see that and then our a uh, is the point of intersection between f and g with coordinates negative 80 degrees is to half write down the value of a and d right so the a here obviously a uh, represents our amplitude so what is our amplitude for f of x if this here is half then we know that our amplitude is obviously a uh, is obviously obviously one but then there's one thing that we need to consider knowing the original uh, function of the sign we know that it goes like this but then with that one here we can see that a uh, so it goes like this, starting from zero, right? Starting from zero, it goes like that. Meaning that if I had to draw the original one, the same way as this here, starting from negative 180, it would actually look like this. So here it is very important that you know the original mother graphs. So the original mother graph would look like this. But then what happened here is that this was this was uh, reflected along the x-axis, which obviously will affect my value of a, my amplitude. So that means my a actually has to be negative uh, one because what we see here is that it is reflected along the x-axis. That's why we have something like this here with our negative 180 here and positive 180. So in blue, this is what originally the sine graph would do. But then in green, this is what we have on the question. 
which indicates that this graph has been reflected over the x-axis, which a reflection over the x-axis will cause our amplitude to become negative there. And then what about the value of D? The value of D obviously is indicating uh, the uh, amplitude there or the device of the amplitude. So if we are looking at this one here, uh, this is a cost graph. Again, we need to know how a cost graph originally behaves, right? So a cost graph originally is like this, right? So it's the same shape that we are seeing here from zero. But then the only difference is that with the original one would have 90 here. And then we would have uh, 180 degrees as the turning point, And here would have 360. Now what happened, we can see that the graph has been squeezed a bit here. So there's a squeezing of the graph, which means the amplitude has been, uh, the, the amplitude has been tempered with. So now looking at this, the value that is at 45, originally it's at 90. The turning point is at 180 originally, but now it's at 90. So what did they do to the amplitude? They halved the amplitude. So meaning how do we indicate that the amplitude has been halved by saying that our D here needs to be a uh, two, right? So originally our cost graph would be G of X is equals to cos X. Now with what they did there by halving the amplitude, that means we have G of X is equals to cos two X, right? So the two here indicates that the amplitude has been halved. Then the D is equals to two. So you see, I get all of these questions from knowing the original, uh, the, the, the original graph of this, the sine and the cos graph original. Then that's how you can determine what has been done. Then, okay, uh, determine the coordinates of D. Where is D? So D is here. You do agree that D is on the same straight line as a as a there so obviously considering that the distance from here to here is 30 then we also know that the distance from here to here would have to be 30 as well so that means we'd say 180 minus 30 so to find uh, the coordinates of d it's just a uh, simple Let's say negative 180 plus 30, or you can say 180 minus 30, which will give you a 150, right? So negative 150. So negative 150. So if you do it like this, it gives you negative 150. So that means D, the coordinates of D are actually negative 150 is to 1 over 2. So you are simply just using the translation to say that we do understand that this point here will have to be in the same position as this one. So if you are looking at this one, same thing that happens here is the same size in here, right? So obviously, if it's 30 units away from the origin, that means it has to be 30 units also away from this x-intercept here. Then uh, 6.3 for which values of x is f decreasing for, for x element of negative 180 degrees to one to positive 180 degrees. Where is it decreasing? So obviously, if you want to find where F is decreasing, you have to find that from the turning point. And then as we can see from this turning point to that turning point, you can see our graph is decreasing, right? So we see our graph is decreasing. And then we have to say this is X element of negative 90 degrees positive 90 degrees so remember not to say inclusive remember at the turning point the graph is neither increasing or decreasing so that's why you have to say in between nine, negative 90 to positive 90 where nine, negative 90 and positive 90 are not included right so do not put in square brackets there because at this point it's not decreasing it's not increasing it's just stationary there those are stationary points then f of x times g of x less than zero now what is the interpretation for this one it means where where if you had to multiply the two you'd get a negative now it goes back to the fact that we know that a negative can be achieved by saying positive times negative it's negative 
or negative times positive is negative. So basically, if you multiply signs, they are not the same. But then in terms of the graph, what does it mean? This means, so f of x, let's interpret, times g of x less than zero means that a uh, one graph is above x axis while the other while the other graph is uh, below the x axis within the same point within the same uh, interval of x coordinate within the same interval right so within that interval that i'm going to be checking at i need to see one graph being above and the other graph being below right so it's in between negative 180 to zero note that we are told to only check in between here right so now let's start with this let's start with a easy exercise suppose that i just want to cut it from here Suppose that I want to cut it from 132. Now, tell me what's happening here. We can see that both of the graphs are above the x-axis. So that means they are both positive. So positive and positive gives us a positive. It doesn't cut uh, the requirement. Now, suppose that I want to now cut it from here. And then all the way up until... Uh, 45 negative 45 what is it that i'm seeing there and then again let me choose to cut it here right so if we go to the orange part again we can see that both of them are above the x-axis so that means they are both positive again this one wouldn't cut the requirement but then there's something interesting happening between negative 135 to 45 the graph of f is above the x-axis, meaning it's positive, but the graph of g is below the x-axis, meaning it's negative. Now, this is the requirement. One must be above the x-axis and the other must be below the x-axis so that when you multiply them, they give you a negative. So that means our solution here is when x is an element of negative 135 degrees, all the way up until negative 45 degrees only right only because we are only required to check that in between here right from what negative 180 to zero and that's how uh, you just go about answering those questions there so as you can see a lot of your questions from trigonometry will just depend on you having to analyze the diagram and uh, understand how to interpret those questions Okay, so now let's proceed to question seven. Question seven is our 3D trigonometry. So it says question seven, um, we are given in the figure below, KM is a vertical flag post, a flag post set in the center of two circles, which lie on the same horizontal line. MKN is equal to MLK, uh, and they are both equal to x degrees. The radius of the inner circle ML is r units, and the radius of the outer circle MN is 2r units. Calculate the value of x, right? So for six marks. Now, uh, I have done this question before, so if you still want to understand it a bit more, you can check out that video. Also, uh, send a link below. But then, the one thing that you must always know when it comes to this question is that you have to solve this question based on the common side, right? Now, if you can check, we have x degrees on this triangle, and we also have x degrees on this triangle. But the common side uh, between these two triangles, let's call this triangle 1 and triangle 2, is actually a km, right? So km is the common side between this. But then what are we looking for here? We are looking for the value of x, right? So what we are going to do here is uh, looking at this, we can see that, okay, this is 90 degrees here. And then we have that. Again, this is a vertical line. And then there's a horizontal lines meeting here from what we are being told on the statement. So let's go back and read the statement so that we are sure of everything. Now, what are they saying? 
in the figure below km is a vertical flag post set in the center of two circles which is on the same horizontal plane so this is in the same horizontal plane now i know that 3d drawings can be a bit confusing to digest but then understand that if we are saying this is a vertical pole and it's meeting with a horizontal line obviously we do understand that here we must have a 90 degree right so that's the first thing that you need to figure out we need to have a 90 degree there so let me minimize so that i can answer the question okay so here I'm supposed to have 90 degrees. So which may, which makes triangle one and triangle two a 90 degree angles, right angle triangles, right? So that means I can easily calculate uh, the value of X by using Sokato. Sokato. But then note that I'm going to approach this based on the common side. So I will try to make KM the subject of the formula in both the equations. So with this one, I can see that I'm given the angle here. And then if I want KM to be involved, I can say this is opposite over what? Adjacent, which I would have to use tan, right? So I would go in triangle, in triangle, K, K and M. K and M, which is this one. I would say tan X is opposite, my opposite being what? 2R, MN. Over what? Over the adjacent, which is KM. Now that means if I make KM the subject of the formula, this will be t 2R over what? Tan X degrees. So, okay. We'll say this is equation number one. Now, if I go to this triangle here, KLM, so this triangle here, KLM, I gain and express this in terms of KM, then I have this one here, which is opposite, but then again I have R here, which is what? Adjacent. Then I would say tan X is equals to opposite is km but then my adjacent is r so again if i want to make km the subject of the formula that's km is equals to uh, r times tan x i will call this equation number two right now at this point i have km as a uh, equation one and km as equation two now both of them are equal to km that means i can equate equation one and equation two so this is a uh, 2r over tan x is equals to r times tan x if i cross multiply here this is 2r is equals to r and then tan squared x which means i would have to divide both sides by r to get rid of that r and then now i'm left with what two so this is tan squared x is equals to two and I can square both sides to get rid of the square there. That's a uh, tan x is equal to root 2. Now to calculate my value for x, I will say x is equal to tan, a tan, and then root 2. Then simply just grab my calculator and then go shift tan and then root 2. That's 54.74. 54.735 so it's 74 degrees there we go there we go and then just like that you have calculated the value of x so if you take it from the common side then it becomes easier to deal with then 7.2 they say if r is equal to 5 meters so R now they give us that it's 5 meters. That means 2 times 5 is 10 here. And uh, then LMN is 110 degrees. And then calculate the size of LN. Now looking at this, we can tell that this is cosine rule because we have a side, a side, and an angle in between. So whenever you have side, a side, and an angle in between, then you know that you have to use the cosine rule, which goes a... Uh, this is ln squared will be equals to. So remember the original uh, one is coming from a squared is equals to b squared plus c squared minus 2bc 
cos A. So we are going to do that. Our A squared, we can take it as ln squared. And then the B squared and the C squared are the two uh, sides that are given here. So that's lm squared plus uh, mn squared minus again 2 lm times mn. Then the cos A, the angle A will be representing the one that is given here, which is uh, lmn. Lmn. Now it's just a matter of substituting. ln squared is equal to lm, it's 5 squared. And then mn is 10 squared. Then we have 2 times 5 times 10. And then cos 110 degrees. Then you simply just punch everything into your calculator there. So your ln squared will be equals to 159.20 if you round off to two decimal places. And then if you square both sides like this, then your ln is now equals to 12.62 meters. Right. Okay. So now we are done with your uh, 7.2. 7.2. Done. So just like that, you have your eight marks. So now we are on question eight. It says in the diagram below, points A, B, C, and D lie on the circumference of a circuit with AD parallel to AC, to EC, meant to say. Then CB is produced to E, and then GD is a tangent to the circuit at D, and DB is equals to AD, right? Then EBA is equals to 67 degrees. 8.1 says calculate with reasons the size of the following angles. So ADC, so ADC, it's ADC, that means we are looking for this angle here. But then if we can check, um, this here we have a cyclic quadrilateral. So we can see all the four vertices there touching the circumference. There we go. Then as we can see here, this is an exterior angle of a cyclic quad. So it's supposed to be 67 degrees. So 67 degrees exterior angle of cyclic quad. Then what is our angle for C? So the angle for C, you can see that uh, it is here. We have uh, this here. Remember, these ones are parallel. So if they're parallel, we have core interior angles here. And then what do we know about core interior angles? They must always sum up to 180 degrees. So that means we can have 180 minus 67. And then this will give us 113 degrees. And then the reason would be core interior angles. But then whenever you are giving a reason for core interior angles, you must also remember to mention a uh, the parallel lines right so where you say bc is parallel to ad right and then let's fill that in 113 degrees we are now looking for angle a but then we are saying this is a cyclic quad what do we know about opposite interior angles of a cyclic quad they add up to what they add up to 180 degrees as well so 67 degrees and our reason is that a uh, opposite interior angles of cyclic quad. So the opposite interior angles of a cyclic quad, they add up to a 180 degrees. Then now we are looking for D2. So where is D2? D2 is in here. But then we can find D2 if we have already found that this is 67 degrees. By mainly saying that, uh, so this one, I think we might have to show it a bit. So we can start by saying our B2 has to be equals to 67 degrees as well. And the reason is uh, base angles of isosceles. Base angles of isosceles. Or you can say angles uh, angles opposite equal sides, right? So not accustomed to that reason. Uh, angles opposite equal sides. Same thing. Then that means we have 67 degrees here. Now, obviously, to find D2, let me clear up here so that we can all see. To find D2, do realize that if we are saying that the triangle of interest is this, 
Okay. The triangle of interest is this. Then that means if we say this is 67, and then this is 67, we have to get this by using a uh, sum of interior angles of a triangle. So D2 would have to be 180 minus 67 minus 67. And then our D2 would be equals to uh, 46 degrees. And then our reason for that is sum of interior angles of triangle. Right. So 46 degrees. Okay. So when it comes to this BDG, uh, BDG is all of this, BDG. And then if we are to check here, this is a tangent. And then this is a chord. Now, if you look at this whole angle here in reference to C, uh, we can tell that this is tan chord theorem, an angle between the tangent and the an angle between the tangent and the chord is equal to the angle in the alternate segment. But then remember, for angle C, we found 113 degrees. So that means BDG would also be 113 degrees. And then our reason would be a uh, tan chord theorem. Tan chord theorem. Tan chord theorem. Okay, now 8.2 is saying prove that AB is equals to CD. Prove that AB is equals to CD. So where is our AB? Prove that AB is equals to CD. Now in order to prove that, uh, we have our our D2 here was an angle of 46 degrees, right? Then remember here, what did we get? This here is 113 degrees. And then we don't have uh, the size of D3, but then we do have the whole size of this one. So we did find ADC, and then we found the whole ADC to be 67 degrees. So meaning we can find the angle in here by saying 67 minus 46, and then this is 21, okay? So all I'm trying is to calculate uh, the size of B3. Then, okay, let's now say I have my D1 being 21 degrees, and then my B3 will be equals to 180 so that's 180 minus 118 minus 21. Then my B3 is equals to 180 minus uh, 113 minus 21. This is 46 degrees. Right. Now, if we are saying that the sides are equal, one thing we know about equal sides is that they will subtend equal angles on the circumference. So CD is subtending B3, which is equals to 46 degrees. But then also AB, it's subtending uh, D2, which again, we did prove that it is what? 46 degrees. Now, if BA is subtending 46 degrees and CD is also subtending 46 degrees, then we can say that they are equal, right? So B3 is 46 degrees, but then also D2, is 46 degrees and then this was proven above so here let's say sum of interior angles of triangle now that we can conclude that a b is actually equal to c d based on what reason equal chords subtend equal angles. So equal chords subtend equal angles. Right, so we have question nine and we are ready to swim with the sharks. It says uh, 9.1 in the diagram below, A, B, C, and D are points on a circle with center O. OB intersects 
AC at M, the midpoint of chord AC. Then let B, D, C, B equal to X. And then we are told here, determine with reason in terms of X, the size of O1. Now looking at this, we can see this is our arc and our arc is obtaining an angle at the center and also subtending an angle at the circumference. Now from this, we are reminded of the theorem that says an angle at the center is twice the angle at the circumference, provided that they are subtended by the same arc or chord. So if this is x here, yeah, then this has to be twice that angle, so it has to be 2x. So q01 is 2x, and then angle at center equal to 2 times angle at circumference. Now, okay, when we come to ABO, 4 max, this is what we are supposed to do. So ABO is this angle in here. So we can try to tackle that based on this triangle that we are seeing here. Right, so I want you to focus on this triangle here. And then what we can see here is that our M2 has to be equal to 90 degrees, mainly because there is a line drawn from center there is a line drawn from center uh, to the midpoint of the chord, to the midpoint of chord. So we know the theorem that says if we draw a line from the center to the midpoint of the chord, then it will be perpendicular to the chord. Right. So, okay. Now, if we have this as 90 degrees, and then let's look for A1. Looking at A1, we can see that if, again, we look at chord BC. Chord BC is obtaining an angle here, which is A1, and then also subtending an angle there, which is equals to X. So angles subtended on the same uh, chord, they are equal, right? Because they're subtended by the same chord here. So that means A1 is also equals to X. And our reason is angles on the same segment. Angles on the same segment. But then what do we see now? If we can pay attention to that green triangle, we have an exterior angle here, which must be equal to the sum of the two interior angles of a triangle. But then remember, we are trying to get what is this here. So when we add to this plus this, we must have the 90 here. Now, if we have x, then you do understand that here we need to have what? 90 minus x. Now, if you say 90 minus x plus x, that is exactly 90 degrees. So that means angle ABO should be equals to 90 minus x and your reason is exterior angle of a triangle now if you don't see that you can also use the fact that if there is 90 here sum of angles on a straight line that means you also must have 90 here and then you can use the sum of interior angles of a triangle also you'll be able to get 90 minus x there right then uh, prove that a b is a tangent to the circle that passes through point a d r now every time they mention that you want to draw a circle that uh, encompasses all those points that are mentioned there. So ADR, there we go. So that means the tangent is AB. The tangent is AB, then that means uh, our chord is AR. So this angle has to be between the tangent and the chord and must be equal to the angle on the alternate segment. So now by doing so, you are actually breaking down the question to what it actually wants. So in other words here, we are trying to prove that A1 will be equal to D1. So that's the first thing that you do in approaching this question. Try to understand what is it that you are actually trying to prove. Okay, so now when we have this, how can we prove that A1 is equal to D1? Uh, we can start by saying, let's make a D parallel to the whole of O B, right? Or we can say parallel to O M, so O B or O M, right? Now this is based on our midpoint theorem. Remember, this is equals D O is equals to O C because it's radi, but then M C is equals to uh, A M because we, we've been told that M is the midpoint, right? So we know from our midpoint theorem, uh, if these two sides here are equal, then that means it follows that these two lines here must be parallel, right? So from that, what can we get? We can get that O1, remember we now have parallel lines. So O1 must be equal to the whole of angle D. So we will say O1, must be equal to ADC. So ADC. 
which is equals to what? Remember, O1, we found that is 2x, so also this must be 2x. But then if we say this is 2x, remember we have x here, that means we also must have x there. So therefore, d1 must be equals to x, right? But then remember from the previous question, we had already proven that a1 is equals to x because of uh, the x in here and that one, the angles on the same segment. But then remember, this is what we were trying to prove. So therefore, a1 is equals to d1, right? Which would then make our ab, so that means ab is a tangent. And then our reason is converse tan quad theorem. Tan quad theorem. An angle, uh, an angle between the tangent and the quad is equal to the angle on the alternate segment. So again, just like that, you have a uh, six marks. Easy peasy. The 9.1.3 for four marks, they say prove that AD square is equals to 4DO square minus 4AB squared plus 4MB squared. Now, this is the one I feel should have been six marks instead. So, I want you to have a look at this whole triangle here. The whole triangle. There we go. Now, suppose that we want to use a Pythagoras theorem there, because uh, as we can see here, our A2 definitely has to be 90 degrees because of uh, angles on a semicircle or angle on a semicircle. So it is being subtended by a diameter. DC is a diameter, it's passing through the center. So this is 90 degrees over there. So that means we can use Pythagoras theorem because this is a right angle triangle. Now we can go DC squared is equals to AD squared and then plus AC squared. So we are using this and then, but remember, but let's say our DC, the whole of DC will be twice DO. Remember, I'm trying to have something like this here. I'm being guided by this, right? So I'm being guided by what I have here. So I will say my DC is twice DO. Because now you understand that this side here and that they are equal. So if this is DO, I can also conclude that this is DO because OC and DO are actually equal. They are ready. Then, and also again, and uh, AC, where is AC? AC is twice AM. Also again, uh, I'm being guided by something here. So by this, because the AM is where I'm going to get the AB and the and the MB. So which is why I'm changing this to twice AM. So AC is actually twice AM. So because also this is equals to that. So if this is AM and then MC is also equals to AM, then I can say this is also AM. Okay, so now let, let me change here. This will become 2D O square is equals to AD squared. So I'm not changing AD because I can see it's AD here. I have to make it the subject of the formula. Then AC, I can change it to 2AM square. Then this will give me 4D O square is equals to AD square plus 4AM square. Now, to deal with AM, let's now fix our eyes here. Let's now fixate our eyes on this smaller triangle here. And then for this smaller triangle, remember, I did prove that we have a 90 degree there. So that means I can still do Pythagoras theorem. So now I'm focused on this smaller triangle here. Let me say in triangle AMB. Right, so this was in triangle a, 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 D, C. Now, if I have to focus on this triangle, I can also do Pythagoras theorem by saying uh, this is A, B square is equals to A, M square plus uh, M, B square, which I can then make my A, M square as the subject of the formula. A, M square is equals to A, B square minus M, B square. 
So this is Pythagoras. But the note, check, A, B, M, B. I can now replace the A, M squared by A, B squared minus A, M, B squared. So therefore, let me call this equation 2. And then let me call this equation 1. Then I will say substitute equation 2 into equation 1. So this means I have 4D O squared is equals to 8D squared plus 4. And then where there's AM, now I replace with that expression. AB squared minus MB squared. Right. So this becomes 4D O squared is equals to 8D squared. Then if I multiply here, that's 4AB squared minus 4MB squared. Right. But then remember, I have to make AD squared the subject of the formula. So I can take all this over to this side. That's a 4DO square minus 4AB squared plus 4MB squared. And then is equals to 8D squared. So on the right, I'm only left with 8D squared. Now I can rearrange this and swap this once to 4D O squared minus 4AB squared plus 4MB squared, which if you can check, it's now exactly as what I'm given here. So voila, four marks for that. That's how you were supposed to do that one. So you needed to use these two triangles, the green one, the bigger one, and also the smaller one here. Hey, that's what I mean by we are swimming with the sharks now. Okay, then uh, 9.2 says in the diagram below, LM is a tangent to circle QNM WP at M, where NW cuts uh, QM and PM at U and V respectively. Then we are told that NQ is equals to WQ and NQ is parallel to MP. 9.2.1 say state with reasons three angles equal to M2. Right. So M2 is this angle here that we are given in between here. But then since we are given that this is parallel to that, we know that uh, we can see an alternate angle here. So look at the Z shape. So which would mean our M2, so number one, our M2 is equals to Q from what? Alternate angles. Then every time we give alternate angles, we must also give a pair of those parallel lines and Q parallel to MP. So this here would be equals to M2 as well. But then uh, looking at this here, we have a tangent. We are told about the tangent. And then if we can check tangent and chord, they subtend an angle at the uh, alter, they, they, they subtend an angle uh, at the segment there on the alternate segment. So that means number two, our M4 would actually be equals to Q, which we did prove that Q is equals to M2. And this is because of what? Tan chord. Now that's our M4. And then uh, what else again? Uh, we can also prove that our W1, now look at W1. If we kind of check here, uh, where is our where is our Q? So this is our Q. It is being it is being subtended by chord N M. So chord N M subtends an angle here at Q, but then the same chord N M subtends an angle at W1. Right. So we can say that W1 is equals to Q, which we did prove that is equals to M2. And then the reason why W1 is equals to Q is because angles on the same segment. Angles on the same seg. Right. So just like that, we have proven three angles that are equal to M2. Now, 9.2.2. So this was 9.2.1. 9.2.2 say now, uh, prove that triangle WMV. So WMV is which one? So let's check. I like to just indicate my triangles so that I'm not confused. WMV would be this one. And then QMN. Let's locate QMN. QMN would be this one here. Nice. So we are trying to prove a similarity, then we need to say in triangle 
uh, WMV and also triangle QMN. We have number one. So this is how you prove it. Everything has been arranged for you here. What you are trying to prove is that how is W equal to Q? How is M equal to that M? And then how is V equal to that N? That is the format. So once you have that, it becomes easier to do it. So we have W and Q. Now I've kept this one deliberately so that you can see. Already we have proven how W is equal to Q. So the W1, remember, is equal to Q because they're angles on the same segment. So we'll say W1 is equal to Q. And then we can just say proven above, right? Because we have already proven it on the previous question. Then number two, how is the M1 here equal to the M, which is M3 right there, right? So we can say M1 is equal to M3. And the reason for that is because they are subtended by equal angles. Note that QN is subtending M3, but, this, but PW is also subtending M1. So if these are of equal length and then they subtend angles, those angles must be equal. So equal chords subtend equal angles. That's our reason. And then equal chords subtend equal angles. Then number three, remember, we need three proofs. Then V and N. How is our V1 here uh, equal to the whole of N, N1 and N2? So remember, if we've already proven two, uh, if we can't prove that one, we just say V1 is equals to N1 plus N2. And then our reason can either be third angle of triangle, or you can say it's because of sum of interior angles of triangle, right? What you are essentially saying is that if I have two triangles and then I've proven that two of their, their, of their angles are equal, then it goes without saying that obviously that that angle also has to be equal because the sum of interior angles of all triangles, irrespective of how big or small they are, they must always add up to 180 degrees. So that is based on that fact. That's why we are saying that, uh, that angle of a triangle or sum of interior angles of a triangle. Then, okay, now prove that MV over WV is equal to MN over PW. So when you prove this, this is coming from the similar triangles that you just proved, that you have just proven above. Now we know that triangle WMV is similar to triangle QMN. Now if you do your eyebrow, eyebrow, eyes, so what I normally say when I say eyebrow, eyebrow, eyes is you take this over that, and then this over that. So now you have your eyebrows. Then you have your smile, smile, right? Eyebrow, eyebrow, smile. Then this is, this will be WM over QM, which will be MV over MN, uh, MN, and then equal to uh, WV over QN. Right. Now, obviously, looking at this, we can see that what we actually want from this is a, so we are looking for MV over MN and WV over QN. Right. So why? Because looking at this, we have MV, check, and then we have WV, check. Right. And then also we have MN, check. Right, so that's how we choose it. Now we can see that we don't have any WM, we don't have any QM. So that means we'll go with this two here. This is MV over MN is equals to WV over QN. Right, now at this point we can say cross multiply MV times QN is equals to MN times WV. Now, what we are trying to do is write this in that form, right? So what can we do so that we end up with that? Uh, we want to have our WV right down here. And then we want to have uh, our QN. So remember, we have this PW here that we don't know where it's coming from, but then we'll, fi we'll find out. Then we can say, to get rid of this, we'll say, uh, let's divide both sides by WV times QN. Then also here, WV times QN. Now, obviously, the QN and the QN will cancel here. The WV and the WV will cancel. So I'm left with MV over WV, which is now in this format. So happy. Then we have MN over QN. 
Now our problem is this QN here because we don't have it. We actually have PW. But then let's check something here. This is where we go back to the graph. The QN, we've been given that it is equals to what? PW. So we'll say, but QN is equals to PW. Then that means we can now rewrite this as MV over WV is equals to MN over PW. Now it is very important to note that you are writing all of this because of what? Similar triangles. So this is coming from the similar triangles that you have proven here. Okay, so just like that, uh, now you have your solution for 9.2.3. Let's look at question 10. Um, we are given in a triangle ABC below D and E are points on sides AB and AC respectively, such that DE is parallel to BC. Prove the theorem which states, which states that AD over DB is equal to AE over EC. Now with this one, you want to start by constructing your perpendicular heights like that. So from point D and point E, and indicate the perpendicular heights, can choose to name them H and then K. And when you write, you start by saying construction, and then also continue to join this one here. So you'll also construct line B to join E and then a line also DC here. So join points D and C. So you'll say for your construction, join uh, DC and BE and heights and heights H and K. Then you start solving here by saying area of triangle ADE over the area of triangle DEB. So the DEB we are talking about is this triangle here. So DEB. Now, looking at this triangle, we can see that its perpendicular height will obviously be the K here. So looking at this, we can see that it's in this format, whereby our perpendicular height is indicated like that, being the K. Right. Then this will be equals to what? This will be half base times height. So half the base of this in respect to making K the perpendicular height, the base would have to be AD here. And then the perpendicular height is K. Then over half, our base in this case would have to be uh, DB, and then our perpendicular height K. Now, obviously the K and the K will divide out and the half and half will divide out. So we'll only be left with AD over DB. So just like that, we have this first part here. Then we go to the second part, say, okay, now, Let's go to area, again, of triangle ADE over the area of triangle. Now we are left with this one, DEC, right? Triangle DEC. Now, again, if we are looking at DEC, we can tell that our perpendicular height is H, right? So also this one is in this fashion. So where we might have a, excuse me for that. So where we might have something like this and then our perpendicular height coming along like that. So it's H. Now, this will be half the base looking at triangle ADE from this reference uh, side. The base would have to be AE, right? So the base would have to be AE here. Then, which means uh, we have our half base is AE and then our perpendicular height being H. Then again, we have half the base uh, for this triangle here uh, would have to be EC, right? So the base is this one here. And then times the perpendicular height H. And the H and H will divide out and the half and half divides out. So we have AE over EC. So note that our bases are this side here. Then, at this point, we can say, obviously, we know that 
area of triangle ADE is exactly the same as the area of triangle ADE because we simply just use the same triangle, just that we changed the basis. But then again, the area of triangle DEB should be equal to the area of triangle DEC. And this is because they have the same base, they have the same height, and they lie within the same parallel line. Lie within same parallel lines. Right, so that's the reason you always give out for that. Then, uh, so this was DEB. DEB. Okay, so now that you say that uh, the this triangle is equal to that triangle and also the denominator triangles are equal, then in other words, we can say the area of triangle ADE over the area of triangle DEB is actually equal to the area of triangle ADE over the area of triangle DEC, which means the answer that we got from here, AD over DB, can be equated from there uh, with the answer that we got here. So which is AE over EC. And from that, voila, now you have this. You have proven the theorem, which states that if you have a line drawn parallel to one side of the triangle, then it will uh, divide the other two sides into equal proportions, right? Okay, so nice. That's how you do your proof for six marks. Then let's now proceed. We have 10.2. It says A, B, C, D is a parallelogram with diagonals that intersect at M. J is a point on BC. BJ uh, is to JC is a uh, two is to three, and then AG meets BD at K. BD is parallel to JL, and JL meets AC at L. Q is a point on AD such that AB is parallel to QM. Right? Then they say ten point two point one determine with reason the following ratios. So ML over LC. So where is ML? This is ML and then LC. Then here we are given BJ and JC. Now, if you can check this triangle here, you can see our proportionality theorem from that triangle there. So we have this line here has been drawn parallel to one side of the triangle, which obviously will have to divide uh, the two sides into equal proportions. Right. So that means if we have our BJ, JC is 2 is to 3. So we can say this is 2K and then this is 3K. Right. So it must be the same proportion as what? As uh, this. So we are saying BJ. BJ will correspond to ML. So we will say uh, ML over LC is actually in the same proportion as BJ over JC. And then this is prop theorem. That means our reason, our ML over LC will also be equal to 2 over 3, right? So correct. For two marks, that's all we are supposed to do. So that was your A. And then for B, we have AK over KJ, right? Now for this one, we have to be a bit careful. So let's locate that. AK is AK. So we have our AK here and then KJ. So we are looking at this one here. We are looking at this one. Then if we can just check A, we have our AK over KJ. So this is it. And then we can say uh, that one is in proportion to this. If you can check here, AM and ML. AM and ML. Again, we can see that here is our line drawn parallel to one side of the triangle. So there we go. And then to that. Okay. So now at this point, you can say that in order to find that, this is what we are going to do. Remember, we already have the length of ML. Uh, it's Let's indicate it as 2K. But then the one thing that we know is that our AM is equals to MC because these are diagonals of a parallelogram. 
diagonals of parallelogram. So we know that AM is equals to MC, right? Now, remember from previously, we had that this is 2 over 3, so the LC will be 3K. Then if this is 2K and 3K, that means the whole of AM must be 5K, right? And then AK over KG is uh, in proportion to that. So I'm going to say MC or AM over ML is actually in proportion to AK over KJ. And then this is out from Pop theorem. Right? Then that means AK over KJ is actually 5 over, remember, 5. If I have 5K here, then this would be 5P. And then we can take this one as 2P. So this is 5 divided by 2. So 5 over 2 becomes a, the ratio for that. And then done. Now let's look at 10.2.3. It says if AB, so let me erase all of this here. It says now if AB is equal to root 10 units and BC is 2 over 3 AB, then calculate the length of AQ. So let's be careful with this one. Let's gather our fact. Uh, number one, we know that BM would have to be equal to MD. Again, because of diagonals of a parallelogram. Right? And then also, we know that uh, QM is parallel to AB. And then this has been given. So we can see it here. Then, okay, what can we do now? We know that the whole side of AD is actually equals to BC because these are opposite sides of a parallelogram. Now, opposite sides of a parallelogram are equal in length. Then that means we can come to a point whereby we say, since we know that uh, Q to M goes all the way to the midpoint here, M, then this would make our AQ being equals to what? To QD, right? Because line passing, there is a line passing through the midpoint. Through the midpoint, right? So this is it. So our AQ here is the same line as QD. Now, if we are saying that the whole of AD is equals to BC, and then we have just uh, noted that AQ is equals to QD because this is drawn to the midpoint, then that means in other words, we can say that AQ should be half of BC, right? So AQ should be half of BC. But then what is uh, BC? BC we have been given that is 2 over 3AB. So we can say our AQ now is equals to half, and then our BC is actually 2 over 3 a, B. But then when we check here, we've been given uh, the length of A, B. So we can come here and say half and then bracket 2 over 3, then multiply that by root 10. Now at this point, we know the 2 and the 2 will cancel out. So we are left with root 10 over 3 being the size of A, Q. And that's how you were supposed to go about tackling that question for 15 marks. And then, okay, we have reached a the final part of the question so you can see our total is 150 so make sure that uh, you practice as hard as possible and just try to supplement the marks from here with your paper one so you always know the trick strike very hard in your paper one uh, so that in paper two you are just uh, wanting to supplement your marks there because we all know that paper two can be a bit tiring and then a bit too long because some of you don't even reach uh, all the way up until question 10. But then it's something that you should work on by practicing much more often. And then always remember when you practice, time yourself so that you are able to uh, to be aware of time. Remember, you are not just only uh, wanting to collect your marks, but you are competing against time. You only have three hours 
to uh, write everything that you can and also be able to accumulate all your marks. So make sure that you put in the practice and you time yourself as you practice there. So go through all the topics that are giving you a challenge and just make sure that you go out there and ace your exam. Remember, have an aim of uh, how many marks you want to get so that you can work towards smashing that goal. With all that being uh, said, guys, please hit the subscribe button if you haven't uh, subscribed yet. And uh, most importantly, please share the link with your friends and classmates so that they may also find assistance. Remember, do not be selfish. We are winning as a team.